We are going to continue on with all the isms um, in this time period. So the last lecture I talked about socialism and socialist parties that were, you know, counterbalances to collaborators um, against or basically not a friend to um, Soviet Russia. Um, but what about the Soviet Union and um, <clears throat> how it developed? So first of all, Marxism is officially internationalist. <clears throat> and what I mean is, um, I mean, the, the, the national anthem was the international, the, you know, the, um, the Karl Marx Communist Manifesto ends with workers of the world unite. <clears throat> Lenin often said, the only justifiable war is a civil war, meaning that the workers uh, shoot their oppressors like the business class and uh, um, elites okay um, in other words workers shouldn't kill each other like they did in World War one um, but they should be killing the people sending them off to do the killing and uh, take power that that was his kind of take on it now <clears throat> some people have pointed out many analysts have pointed out that despite the official, rhetoric of internationalism that many um, countries that had communist revolutions from Russia to afterwards in fact did have a type of nationalism um, that you couldn't deny <clears throat> excuse me I'm always having a <clears throat> stuffed throat here when I'm doing these lectures um stuffed throat cough in my throat. anyways so uh, if you look at China and Vietnam, they fought each other while they were communist. Eritrea had Marxists that were fighting communists in Ethiopia. Um, the Russia and China eventually had the split, even though they were both communists. So if you look at the history, the legacy of communism, its goal and its theory was to be internationalist, but it often um, didn't wasn't able to accomplish that not necessarily okay um, and that's not say with everybody who practiced um, communism but I just something to keep in mind Soviet nationalism so there was a type of, of Soviet nationalism that was undeniable and we'll talk a little bit more about that in Stalin's like um, socialism in one country idea but um, <clears throat> when the revolution happened there was a lot of challenges to it. Keep in mind, this is the first time really in history on such a scale that a group actually tried to implement Marx's idea and create an alternative society that was based on something opposite than the capitalist system. <clears throat> so as I was telling you before, this, this revolution actually gave a lot of people hope and inspiration. But, you know, uh, as something new, but it wasn't quite clear how it was going to work. There were a lot of struggles with it. So 1921, Lenin's new economic policy was basically adding in some capitalism to, like he kind of slowed down the revolutionary process and created some economic equilibrium. And then <clears throat> 1922, a new constitution created a federal, a federal state called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And that's what the USSR stood for. And they were like little like kind of <clears throat> network, um, well, for now, I'll just say that it's, you know, we'll just go stay with the definition. Um, and then they opened up trade with Germany and Britain. Lenin dies in 1924. And there's still a debate, I feel like, within history about the process of who is supposed to take place <clears throat> in power um, after Lenin died. But Stalin consolidated his power by 1928 <clears throat> at the expense of his competitor Trotsky <clears throat> my goodness sorry so Stalin versus Trotsky this is an important debate if you guys watch the movie Frida then you're at least I, I can you know we, you'll have something to go with Joseph Stalin um, was basically a general secretary and Lev uh, Davidovich uh, Bronstein 
or known as Leon Trotsky. He was a, a, a Jewish man, and I'm only pointing that out because conspiracies... There was a major conspiracy that Hitler was going to say that all communists and socialists were Jews. And that wasn't true. And in fact, there would be some persecution of Jews within the Soviet Union. But many people pointed out that Karl Marx was, you know, his grandfather was a rabbi, even though that his um, father converted to Protestant Christianity. And in the Russian Revolution, initially, a, a very important characters like Trotsky, who was also almost in power in the Soviet Union, were Jewish. And many, you know, I had a global Jewish writers class, um, and there was a book on Jews and socialism. And a, many explained the real reason is that simply Jewish people were um, often persecuted as minorities. They weren't really able to fit in very well with all the rising nationalism. So the theoretical internationalism of, of, of uh, communism and socialism um, to find a way to have worker solidarity as opposed to ethnic solidarity, um, to be an economic underclass in some of the ghettos and all those different factors made socialism very appealing and communism to um, Jews. And that, that was basically what was the thesis of the book that I read when I was in that global Jewish writers class. So I'm just throwing that your way. But of course, it led for Hitler and Nazis to basically say that communist and Jewish is the same. Okay, <clears throat> so there's a five-year plan that's set up by. Well, actually, let me let me back up. Stalin is going to put Trotsky out of power. So Tr Trotsky was popular. He was also a hard-headed guy, <clears throat> and um, he ends up getting sidelined and basically exiled by Stalin, okay? So, um, 1928, five-year plan, industrial and agricultural. Five to 10 million people died in this process. Now, remember I talked about how industrialization has been always brutal. Now, this is always blamed, you know, these kind of excessive deaths on Stalin's evilness or the inherent evils of communism Certainly, that's this number is too big to take lightly. Um, but at the same time, I kind of want to point out that we've seen a pattern that industrialization and modernization has often been ugly in no matter what country it's been under, no matter what specific ism that it's been under. Okay. And then what Stalin does is is uh, and then to move on to that, he really consolidates his power with in the Soviet Union, and there's what's called the Great Purges. So before World War II, Stalin was just knocking off party members left and right and consolidating power. <clears throat> and that also was kind of a brain drain uh, uh, for, for a large extent. A lot of the old Bolsheviks or a lot of the old revolutionaries were actually um, killed or imprisoned by Stalin. Now, for all of that uh, said about him, um, he also industrializes, he does industrialize um, the Soviet Union. And he once said, no comrades, the pace must not be slackened. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries in terms of industrialization. We must make good this lag in 10 years. Either we do it or they will crush us. Now, he said that in the, the uh, at a time period about 10 years is about what we're going to get to World War II. You can't argue with Stalin on the fact that um, industrializing Russia was important and when the Nazis invade Germany one could argue that Stalin prepared Russia to actually be able to withstand the, Nats, the Nazi invasion. So does that make him now justifiable in your mind? What does that make you think? Uh, again this is up to you. I'm just merely pointing out that Stalin's harsh industrialization plans also may have helped save Russia as well as killed Russians. That's that. All right. Um, and uh, I want to finish this up just to say, if you've seen the movie uh, Frida Kahlo, uh, well, we'll go into that in, in the next section. Okay. All right. Done.